Hello, everyone, and welcome to Fantasy Fellowship Con 2022. Uh, my name is Rory, and I'm from the Fantasy Fellowship Innovation Team. We're thrilled to have Sara with us for this author Q&A. Uh, she's the author of The Final Strife, a debut novel, which was released in June. There it is there. <laughs> wait, wait, there we go. <laughs> and it's the first in a trilogy called The Ending Fire. When this book was announced for publication, it was described as N.K. Jemisin meets Patrick Rothfuss and is about Scylla, a spiky heroine with a heart of gold. She was raised to be a rebel, but is that really her destiny? We have this book scheduled for an official FF buddy read in November, but I know quite a few of us couldn't wait that long to read it, including me, especially when <laughs> Sara was announced for the convention. Uh, if you haven't read it yet, be sure to jump over to our community Discord and sign up after the Q&A. Well, our community members have submitted lots of questions for you, so let's get started. Hi everyone, this is so exciting. <laughs> I know. <laughs> okay, so our first question. Erin said, the response to the final strife has been overwhelmingly positive. Why do you think readers are connecting to it so strongly? Look, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Why? I'm like, I wrote this book. Re really, I wrote this book for me, right? I was like, da da da, gonna write a book. Um, obviously, I wanted to be an author. It's been my dream for like 20 years. I was, well, actually, since I was really small, it's been my dream. Um, and I, I, there's no one else as surprised by the response <laughs> as I am. Like <laughs> every day I'm like, have you and I'm like, oh five star review. I'm like, but they've read the wrong book. They have they must have read the wrong book because it doesn't make sense to me. Um but it is obviously really amazing. Like it's I don't know. I honestly couldn't put my finger on why people like it. I'm obviously really, really grateful and um uh, yes a tad confused because I'm like it's <laughs> It's something I wrote one day, but um, I'm really just like over the moon. I'm so, so lucky to have the most incredible readers. I had a a wonderful message from a reader who had even got a tattoo based on the final strife. And I was like, yeah, right, I I've made it. Unity. <gasps> oh yeah. my God, that's so amazing. I was like, I've made it. I was like, I was I'm really emotional about that because like for a book to mean that much to someone to get a tattoo, I was like, this is. Yeah, amazing. This is just incredible. So I. I can't really answer the question because it's hard for me to distance myself from my own flaws because I'm like well why <laughs> like there's so many problems <laughs> but at the same time they always say to me my editor in particular is like you've got to have confidence you've got to have so much confidence and you can't show that you're you don't think that this element's good or this element's good you've got to always be like this is amazing and I can't really do that because it's not my personality I can't be like walking around like oh, I wrote the best book in the world because that's not how I feel but I am so touched and like it's amazing because it is a piece of me like it was so much a part of discovering who I was as a black woman for people to to love it like they have is like the most accepting incredible <laughs> feeling because you know growing up as a, a kid that was always bullied I'm like oh my goodness people accept me now it's it's just kind of amazing so yeah can't answer the question, but you know, I, I am really grateful. Yeah, must be a wonderful thing, and yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> um, Damien says that he feels that African inspired fantasy is underrepresented in the genre. So it's fantastic to see stories such as yours getting such recognition and their due. Are there any particular African inspired fantasy books that help to give you inspiration and guide you when writing your book? It's really interesting because um, <clears throat> honestly, I my reading habits weren't necessarily all that healthy in the sense that I was not diversifying what I was reading for probably like the first 30 years of my life um, and part of that is to do with the the fact that I I thought I was white for a really long time and I was trying to assimilate for for so long that I was I was erasing that part of my identity um, and so I wasn't note well of course I was noticing yes like every main character was a white man but it didn't, because I was seeing myself as that main character, it didn't really strike me as odd. 
until I kind of had a reckoning with myself. I was like, look, girl, <laughs> you're black. <laughs> and um, I realized like, and even the things that I was creating for 20 years was always uh, white middle-class fantasy. And the main character was a boy. It's kind of wild to me that that was who I identified with the most to write mm-hmm. a story. And that's because I was just replicating everything I'd read. So in some ways um, I, I didn't have that guidance from books that I was reading because I wasn't reading a diverse range of books. Um, it's only in kind of having that reckoning with myself that I was like, okay, you need to re-educate yourself. And that's been the most wonderful education okay. process and going back and and reading like, N.K. Jemison is obviously huge, um, incredible, incredible, incredible writer, but you won't always find her stuff in Waterstones in the UK. She's massive in the US, but it's it's really interesting to me that that like her her stories haven't blown up in the same way. And I wish I wish she had more of her you know more of her due because it, it's it, the worlds that she creates are just wonderful. River Solomon, um, An Unkindness of Ghosts was one of the most haunting, most wonderful um, novels I've ever read. Uh, they're a brilliant writer um, and Sorrowland was their most recent release um, Evan Winters you know there's, there, there is a whole range of wonderful uh, diverse authors out there and I think it just required me to open my eyes um, and it's a shame at what was being pushed you know even when you're like yeah I used to I used to shop at Amazon and when you put something in an Amazon cart it'd be like oh you've read Name of the Wind how about um you know the painted man and it was the same which those two books that I absolutely love but it's <laughs> it's never it's never a it's, it's just the same checkbox kind yeah. of thing and um I hope that commercially it, it diversifies more but yeah, yeah okay. so in terms of like my inspiration was always the, the most commercial white fantasies and then it was in <laughs> re-educating myself in finding you know having a conversation with the fantasy genre is what the, the product of the final stripe is really well it's a great product <laughs> oh thanks <laughs> no it is a wonderful book definitely well it's a bit of a deeper question now maybe <laughs> a tough one. um phoebe says the ritual maiming of the ghostings was a really tough part to read about and gives the reader a stark insight into how it must be like to live as a servant with an inflicted disability. Can you tell us what you were trying to evoke in the reader when you wrote about it? Yeah, absolutely. So the ghostings are, unfortunately, they're not my creation. They are based on a practice that um, happened uh, in uh, King Leopold II's Belgian Congo, um where it's estimated there's very varying accounts so don't ever quote me on it but um <laughs> there it's in the millions um roughly between like some people say three million some people say eight million um black slaves who had no hands because uh, essentially hands were used as a form of currency they were used as a um form of uh trading system uh also discipline uh there's it, it was a horrific, horrific time. And learning about the Belgian Congo was something that uh, horrified me both for the fact that that was a complete uh, hole in my knowledge. I was like, how have I not heard about King Leopold II? And basically a genocide, a genocide that happened in the Congo, um, roughly 11 million deaths. That's huge. That's that's huge. And um, ne- never had heard of it um so being in my 30s and having that realization was terrifying and so I started delving into so much um so I'm also on the side doing a master's degree in African studies which really complemented everything I was trying to achieve with the final strife and um developing that knowledge and filling and plugging those gaps in my in my knowledge that I didn't I didn't even know I had and so when I came up with the ghostings, like I said, I didn't really come up with them. Like the, the concept of having your hands maimed is, is prevalent throughout history. Um, and having your your tongue cut off is a very well-known uh, slave, you know, torturing tool and um, a way to silence. And so the ghostings, it was really important to me to give them a voice. Um, that's why I worked really hard at developing uh, a sign language 
um, which I can talk about at, at another point. But it was uh, it was about giving those ancestors, those 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 silenced people in our past a voice in a world that's entirely fiction but at so so much of it is also truth so yeah. um when I I saw I saw one of these uh, reviews that was like oh my god I can't read this book this it's so violent it's so bloody there's this entire race that has their hands and tongue cut off and I'm like look you're just reading parts of our history like every <laughs> single violence in this book is based on our history um and that's that's really scary when you think about it because this is a bloody book you know yeah so um yeah I think that was it's it, it's it's terrifying but it's it's yeah. part of our history and that was yeah. that was exactly what I wanted to evoke yeah. and it really a reminder. it's really just a hard-hitting part of the book it's like yeah. very emotional art. yeah definitely definitely so Jagoda says, I loved, I've loved the chosen one trope since watching Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Yes. Do you have a favorite story that features a chosen one? So, so many books feature a chosen one story that um, it's really hard to kind of, it's basically would be me just choosing my favorite book. <laughs> um, but I think that for me, in terms of the trope, the most obvious one is the Lord of the Rings and Frodo um <laughs> and there is something the Lord of the Rings uh, you know it absolutely has flaws every book has flaws it's you know uh it, it's still one of those novels that is really close to me because I it has some of the best it develops some of the best tropes of the genre and I love that. And I think the journey of the chosen one and the hero's journey is so clear in, in Lord of the Rings that um, it's comforting. And that's why we love tropes, because it reminds us of the genre that makes it comforting. So that's probably my most revered in my mind chosen one trope that I love to go back to. You know, it's, it's full. So it's about time that I need to reread Lord of the Rings again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it's inspiration for thousands and thousands of books. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> definitely, definitely. Um, so we got a bit of a more fun random one now. <laughs> What's your favourite fantasy creature and why? <laughs> okay, so um, I'm actually going to be really self-serving and say the Eru's in The Final Strife because <laughs> they took so long to develop. So when I say so an Eru is a really large lizard that you can ride. Now, when I was writing it, I was like, this is so much fun. A lizard that you can ride. Lol. Now, when you think about how a lizard walks, it literally it moves both sides of its body. And you're like, OK, so actually this doesn't really work. So I spent maybe three weeks developing the anatomy <laughs> of an Eru to try and make sure <laughs> that it could run in a way that you could have a carriage and how would the carriage work so the carriage has to be arched so that's really long tail could fit underneath it <laughs> honestly I have so much like drawings of an Eru and at this and then I just became to love them because I was like these are like my babies I've created these I'm like god I've just created a creature <laughs> <laughs> and like there's something about just like they're a bit dragony they're also really docile um yeah. they're they're the horse of the final strife world <laughs> and I just kind of I, I love that that it took me so long to develop this this wild creature that I, I just made it <laughs> 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 um I think we had a question about the ease actually um I can't see it now, so it might not have got chosen to come into the end. <laughs> <laughs> um, we did get asked, was there any particular reason why you chose the blue sand? I think that may have been also why Why did you choose the lizards, but I see you kind of answered that already. <laughs> yeah, so the first thing that ever really came to me was, um, so I say, I, it's, a, it's a bit of a long story, but I'm going to go into it. So <laughs> I, was, <laughs> go <for> it. <laughs> I was sitting on the tube in London and I remember thinking, and I've been rewriting and rewriting the same story, um, which wasn't The Final Strife. It's another book that I had been developing for, I think the last count was about 14 years. I've been developing and trying to get this book published really long time. Um, the truth was it's a really bad book, but anyway, it doesn't matter. No one needs to see it. It's never going to be published, but... <laughs> 
I was writing this book for so long and I was, I was sitting on the on the tube and um, the main character was a white man and I remember just looking around the tube and going wow this is the most diverse um, gender fluid culturally mixed ethnicity mix it was just it was I was looking around I was like this is incredible like yeah. why does my bookshelf not look like this tube yeah. and I was like it, it's just it's just wild to me that you think that London is 40% um, non-white and yet was, ugh, the stat was horrifying it was something like three percent black I think it was I think it was 1.3% black writers um in the UK I don't quote me on it but I'm pretty sure that was what the diversity report said um and that's that's just insane I was like why does my bookshelf just not look like this yeah. and that's when the first thing that came to me was these sun uh, these sand dunes which are actually directly from my memory um I used to live in uh, Abu Dhabi and one of the things that we used to do was go to the desert um take our little trays uh, sandboard down the, the that's down the dunes get sand in all the places you don't want sand um <laughs> really like vivid memories of these huge sand dunes that were so oppressive so hot but also ever changing ever moving um I, re I remember just being so dwarfed by them as a child and thinking how like how do they shift how do they move and having you know nearly toppling in a jeep on them and stuff like that just remembering these really intense feelings of these sound sand dunes and I knew instantly that I wanted to set the world in a, in a desert landscape um it was something that just felt right it was a very emotive to me and on top of that that sand dune was a white tree which is the joba tree um yeah. and I knew as soon as that white tree came to me I was like I know that this tree will symbolize wealth I know the bigger the tree the more wealth you have um and at the same time, I knew that the fruit that came from that tree were going to be a, was going to be a drug. And there were so many metaphors in that. There was so many, so much social commentary in something that represents wealth that then leads to drug addiction and a drug addiction epidemic that I was like, wow, there's something here. There's something here. Um, and so the the setting came first and then Sila kind of walked into it. Um, and the reason they're blue... <laughs> It's because I thought it'd be really cool. <laughs> no, it's a, it's a little bit deeper than that. In that, um, the characters, the, the 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 one of the oppressed groups, there are two ghostings and dusters, blue blooded and clear blooded. Um, what I was trying to do with the clear blooded is that they are silent. They are literally clear. They're invisible. They're called ghostings. Yeah. Um, and then with the dusters, their blood is like dust. It's blue. And I had been so many times growing up referred to my skin was dirt, it's mud, it's, you know, it's, you need to wash those horrible insults I had growing up that um, I thought, how do I take that metaphor and, and translate it into this blood caste system? So having it blue was absolutely a commentary on the dirt, the dust of the dusters and those insults that translate into the real world because, you know, it might be fantasy, but it's very much based in everything that I've ever experienced. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. No, it really is a, a mirror to real life. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, I've got, we've definitely got some more questions here. <laughs> if you could go on a road trip with any of your characters, who would you choose and where would you go? Look, <laughs> I ain't going on a road trip with Sila. No, that would no be chance. Experience. It'd be awful. A Noor <laughs> would be great because she'd be like, oh my gosh, this is so cool. I've never seen a tree before. Oh my gosh, this is a bird. I've never seen a bird. <laughs> but so irritating. I don't think I could stand it. So the only person I could take on a road trip would be Hassa. Um, because you know that she knows all the best places. <laughs> she, she, she absolutely knows the best places. So, um, yeah. and I think I think we'd get on really well, mainly because yeah. I created her. But you know, I think it would. <laughs> I think it would be a great time. Um, so yeah, absolutely go road tripping with her. I would like to go and see the Iru races in uh, Jin Sahalia, which is in the north. Never eat shredded wheat. Northwest of the <laughs> continent. Um, so that would be really cool. 
uh, I would also maybe get in a boat and see where it took me. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> if I had to be in this world, though. No, actually, that wouldn't translate because Hassa wouldn't know where she's going. Yeah, Hass <laughs> yeah, I think I think, yeah, I would quite like to do a tour of the Warden's Empire. Yeah. You know, if 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 embers didn't exist. <laughs> definitely, yeah, no. <laughs> if the oppression was solved. Um, but yeah, no, definitely Hassa. The other two are too annoying. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there are definitely some arguments of Sila. <laughs> yeah, yeah, too similar. <laughs> <laughs> oh. If a film was made of your book, who would your dream director and cast be? Hmm. So we've oh. had lots of discussions and I've got an incredible film agent and we have, I've been asked this multiple times. Um, <laughs> Zendaya as Sila would be incredible, but it's also like, is she just going to be playing the Euphoria character again? <laughs> 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 and also she's so pretty. I don't know if it would necessarily translate. Um, uh, so that is definitely someone that I've thought about. Um, Danielle Brooks, who's in, who's probably too old now, but is in Orange is the New Black. I can't remember her character. Um, she'd be amazing as an Um In terms of director, Barry Jenkins would be amazing. Um, yeah, there's there's been conversations <laughs> in the past, and um, honestly, I'd be happy with anyone. Full white, maybe not <laughs> full white cast, <laughs> maybe not full white. That's all I'm saying. Just not, <laughs> not a full white cast. Um, I would, uh, yeah, I and I think there is something to be said about stepping away from a project when um, it becomes a film because. I actually have a background of uh, script writing. I started as a screenwriter, um, oh. <laughs> trained, actually playwright, screenwriter. Um, so I have experience of, of adapting, but I just, I don't, I think when you envision something as a novel first, I think someone could probably do it better. So I'm like, yeah, anyone want this? Anyone, anyone, <laughs> anyone want to adapt it? <laughs> Take it. <laughs> That would be amazing. That would be amazing. Brutal, but amazing. yes, yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we had a chat with a producer once who said, um, "So we at the time he wanted it, and he said, um, I think this is going to cost the same amount as a Star Wars to make.'" <laughs> I was like, <laughs> "Well, this ain't ever going to get made then." <laughs> yeah, well, we definitely need the lizards for sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I can't. That would be cool to see on scene with your yeah. own carriages worked out. I know, I know. Here are my notes. <laughs> <laughs> Create this exactly as drawn here. <laughs> oh, um, we were also asked, what are some books you always recommend people to read? So you've already recommended a few from N.K. Jamison, but have you got any? Yeah, other? and River Solomon. Um, there's a novel coming out in January that I do really want to, can't wait to scream about. It's uh, God Killer by Hannah Kana. Um, everyone just like write it down. It's going to, it's going to blow your mind. It's so good. Um, and then in just terms of like, these things should always be on your book bookshelves. Toni Morrison and Octavia Butler. Um, I just think everyone should have if ever written. Um, there, there are so many wonderful novels came out, which is YA sci-fi, which isn't necessarily a genre that I read a lot of. Um, Mind Walker by Kate Dillon. It's just so much fun. It's just like I've oh. seen that everywhere at the minute. Yeah, yeah. it's just yeah. <laughs> it's it's so much fun, and um, yeah, I can't I can't recommend that enough. Uh, yeah, and I think. There's some incredible stuff like Tasha Suri is doing really great things with her um, her Burning Kingdoms trilogy. So the Oleander Sword just came out. There are so oh, there's so many. I could like I could talk about this for <laughs> days, but um, all I say is like just just try and diversify. Like if something is if you're look you're about to buy something, question how did this come to me? Was it because a publisher spent a lot of money on the marketing? <laughs> Or is it because it's been recommended to me and actually it's a really diverse cast? Um, so, yeah, I and, and and that's saying that from my own perspective, I have to do that 
a lot and question my own my yeah. own approach to things yeah. um so we'll probably coming up near the end now so maybe just a question or two more what have we got left oh of course your prompt As oh I'm yeah sure many people watching know we're running our readathon in october and one of the prompts is going to be a compilation of all the authors from the con and each is going to pick one and then the readers will have an option so would you be able to give us your prompt yeah well it's <laughs> kind of obvious but i would love you guys to find a book by a black british author male female or otherwise and um it's it's harder than you'd think <laughs> um it shouldn't be that hard but i i i really encourage kind of supporting black british authors when i can so yeah definitely great prompt <laughs> <laughs> so maybe one more question if i have another one before we go um what is it that draws you to the fantasy genre as a reader and then as a writer oh i just fantasy readers are just the best people the best people in the world <laughs> I, just, I just think we we are I think we're all slightly lost souls and we find our homes in these other worlds and it's what draws us together as readers and readers and writers because some now some of my best friends are writers in the genre and I'm like huh why didn't I know you before because <laughs> we are so we're connected in a different way and I think it's because we're all a little bit lost um, and we find our homes in these other worlds and that is absolutely for me why I was drawn first of all as a reader um, having quite a tricky up, upbringing um, real life was really tough so I spent my days reading as far as I could from this world but I also think there's there's something to be said about it being so far outside of our world that it's actually closer so like with the final strife when I'm saying it is it's absolutely a different world but it's almost a circle because it takes you back round to the truth of what we see and that's why I say the final strife is the truth it's my truth it's the yeah. truth of history because it's almost like this um this alternative history this this voice for the unspoken and it's why I could only ever do that in the fantasy genre yeah. I could only ever make that commentary in the fantasy genre by taking us so far outside of this world that we kind of come back around <laughs> um and it, it's just a it's a, an amazing place to kind of play in the gray um the possibilities are endless and that's that's just the best thing it's i don't know i have so much emotion when it comes to the fantasy <laughs> genre sff as a whole um we're the best people, I really think so. And uh, <laughs> the best readers, the the most d diverse readers, um, yeah. the most uh, accepting and welcoming readers. Because I can be like, oh, okay, there's a third gender. Everyone's like, yeah, great, there's a third gender. <laughs> you know, it's not like, yeah. <laughs> wait, but how's what the biology of this? No, yeah. just accept it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's, yeah. there's just there's something really magical maybe yeah. about it so um yeah i it's the best <laughs> yeah it is <laughs> <laughs> yeah so thank you so much for giving up your time to answer all our questions no uh, for the interview this is one of our many fellowship con events for everyone watching so there's many other interviews and workshops on the schedule over the weekend which you can see on the website www.fancy-fellowship.co.uk forward slash con 2022 remember to follow us on instagram where we are fantasy underscore fellowship and twitter where we are fan fellowship if you found the convention discord enjoyable or you just want to chat to a whole bunch of amazing fantasy readers, as Sarah's been saying, we are the best people. So, <laughs> yeah. So if you want to talk to a bunch of us, come join the community discord. There's always people on there chatting about books all hours of the day, all countries of the world. <laughs> so <laughs> definitely you will be welcome there to chat all things bookish and be kept up to date with what's coming next for the fellowship. So... With that, I'll let everyone go. Thank you so much, Sarah, and that's all. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you Thanks. so much for coming. <laughs>